Welcome to the Creative Plan Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews of items, and convention panels, and other exciting things that we run into from time to time. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. So, so he was listed first, but you were listed second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard that at Tuscon we don't use moderators because we don't we're need immoderate. moderators. Yes. We don't need moderation. We don't need those things. Moderators. Right. But our panel is called, just to make sure you're at the right place, what if your book turns into a series, how to prepare for your infinite middle? Because you write a book and you think you're just writing a book. Mm-hmm. Right. So my name is Diana. I write a series of post-apocalyptic fiction, uh, which is basically Beauty and the Beast meets Mad Max. <laughs> and it has a lot of action and a little bit of romance, uh, because, you know, there's that Beauty and the Beast element. Uh, and uh, I, I did not start writing this book. My co-writer wrote the book, and I said no. he he wanted me to read it and give me his opinion I said no you can't do this this is terrible the ending is bad it was so bad I'm not speaking to you anymore (laughs) and that went on for about five days and he said okay fine we can change it you can help me it's like okay but it's terrible but we'll fix it and I think it's much better now well of course because you're part of it right that way it works Yes, it in this case, Charles definitely. And Warren Cooper. Both were like 35 years old, finished a book, told their wife, this was absolutely terrible. I could write a better book than that. Okay. Well, basically, you wrote it. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> uh, my name is Bruce Davis. I write fantasy and science fiction. I have two series. Um, my profit log books is... Um, Gangsters in Space, basically. Um, and then the Magic Law series, uh, Lord of the Rings Meets Law and Order. Um, both are out from my publisher, Brick Cave Media, BrickCave.media, small press out of uh, Mesa. I know I didn't mention that. That's probably where. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, my my fourth book in the Magic Law series, hopefully it'll be out in the spring, Silver Magic. So that's, I guess, why I'm here. Okay, very good. And I'm Ross Lampert. I publish as Ross B. Lampert because there is another Ross Lampert in the world. We're Facebook friends. Turns out his middle initial is also B. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, not my problem. I had it first. Okay, you're older. You're you, older. Claimed I am older. Older. Yes. you claimed the B. You claimed the B. I did. Because your B, you I, I did. not have it. Yes. So uh, right now, these are, are my two books. Um, the third book and last in the trilogy is pretty much done. I'm going through my editor's comments now. And uh, once I get the cover done, it will be out. I was shooting to get it out at the end of this year. Not going to happen. But uh, pretty soon. It's, it's close. And in the meantime, in my abundance period, I'm also working on what are now two nonfiction books for writers, which may become four or five or I don't know how many because I'm looking very seriously at taking one of them and splitting it well, into a bunch of, of smaller it gets pieces. Too big. Well, and that's what's happening. Right, and yeah. you want it digestible. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah, and especially because this is on how to critique. Yeah, our third book is coming out too. Uh huh. Coming up soon. We're get with beta readers right now. Ah, good. So. Okay. Good. Good. All right. So I can start with a story about a story. It's, it's a perfect fit for this, this panel. 
this book was going to be a standalone. And once I finally figured out what the ending was and wrote it, I went, there's more to this story. This story doesn't end there. Uh oh. Because I had no idea what I was going to do with the, the, the rest of the story. I didn't know what the rest of the story was. But you knew there was more. I knew there was more. It was something similar with this when I had said no. This is not going to work. When we changed the ending, it opened up a bunch of possibilities. Yes. Yeah. And that happens. Yeah. Can, can I ask you to project a little bit more? We've got a nasty wine back here at the back. Sure. Of the room. Or you yeah. can come up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or we got there. It's, it's not so bad. Yeah. 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 Come up, yeah. There's a whole row. Um, I, I think that, that kind of opens the question of yeah, uh, sitting in the front row. Uh, 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 we're not, we're not going to ask you questions. I never sit in the front row. In your case, Jimmy, I always sit up front. But just be conscious. There's so just kind of nasty yeah. warnings. Yeah. I got it. You're going to hear a hum. It makes a little different to you. Okay, so what were you saying? I was going to say this opens the question of the difference between a series and, say, a trilogy or a continuing story. Right. Yeah. Um, I write a series. It's a series of standalone books. Mm -hmm. They build on one another. Right. So you can. But you, you can, can read, read them one. almost in any order. Yeah. And while it's all the same characters and events built, it's by no means a trilogy, a continuous yeah. story. Yeah. I don't know. Well, why. It, this is uh, one of the things that I, I've learned over the, the years is there are. So at least two and a to this today actually I'm figuring out there's a third actual kind of, of series there's the, the continuing story series which is what this has turned into where there's a meta plot there's there's a story arc that covers however many books there are whether it's two three 27 whatever and that's where this this magic middle if you don't have that, you're going to be struggling to, to put it together, which is exactly what I, I went through with, with this series. There's also the continuing character series where the character or characters, plural, are the same, but the situations they deal with are different. And, you know, for things like detectives series. Well, like the in-depth series of yeah. like J.D. Robb. It's all about Eve, Eve Dallas and Mark. Right. Right. But it's always a Di long, different situation yeah, every time. Yeah. And yeah. You could read any yeah. of the books in any yeah. order. Yeah. And still enjoy it. And and now I'm I'm drawing a blank on what the, the third third kind of series is, but it um it, it's a continuing world series. Oh right. So like where, you'll have one family <clears throat> for the first three and then maybe their kids. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so each of those is going to have a different set of problems, a different set of challenges in, in putting them together. You know, the, the next series that I'm looking at, at writing, one, I know it's going to be a series, so that's a good start. But whether it's going to be one single arc for the story or whether I'm going to take that same character, lead character, and run him through just a bunch of different circumstances, mm -hmm. that's the thing I have one of the many things I haven't figured out yet. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm going to have to do is do do that work before I actually put the fingers to the keyboard to actually start so the story. Question, Ross. Yes. Are you a plotter or a pantser? Oh, I'm definitely a plotter. I'm a pantser. I, okay. I tried being a pantser with, with this, and when I got, I was 300 plus pages into it, then in the first it was draft, driving you crazy, right? Well, what I was doing was I was riding along, riding along, and I was having a great time. You know, this is going, I don't know where this is going. And so I, I, I literally wrote a note, put it in square brackets, said, I don't know what I'm doing with this chapter. I don't know where it's going, so I'm just going to stop. And I'm going to start another chapter. So I did. And I'm riding along, riding along, having a great time, and I don't know what... What was the plan again? Yeah, well, there wasn't one. That was the problem, except that this was my master's degree thesis. And I was facing my thesis semester, and that's all I had left. So you need to plot it out. And I was saying, boy, you need trouble. And so, yes, I went through and I built an outline, 
And then I went from 320, 300-ish uh, pages, took the manuscript, set it here, took the outline, set it there, and started going page by page, and when it didn't fit, it went. I took out 183 but pages. But those things that we do, like I've taken out the first six chapters yeah. of a, another thing I've been working on. And it, suddenly it's so much better. Yeah. The beginning is so much yeah. better. But I think those first six chapters were important for me to know yes. who it was I was writing about. Yes. yes. So just because I didn't keep them doesn't mean that it wasn't important. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So which one are you? I'm, a, I'm an inveterate answer. Okay. I, I keep I, copious notes of all I the people. I make up people that I like, uh -huh. and then I just turn them loose and let them right. tell their story. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. kind of like that. You know it's you, but it also feels like it's them taking over. Sort mm -hmm. of. I, I think that speaks to the kind of series that you choose, though. Yeah. yeah. If you're a plotter, I can see you doing the long three book story arc. Yeah. If like me, yeah, I don't plot anything. Sure. I'm much yeah. better off with oh, here's the situation I'm going to throw at this group right. of people. Right. How are they going to get out? Yeah. Of How it? are they going to get out of it? Right. In the next book, oh, here's another situation yeah. I'm going to throw I at these people. Yeah. And I, I'm actually what I call a plotzer. Okay. <laughs> where I'm, I'm a hybrid between a, a plotter and a pantser. I I lay out an outline, but then I start the you know whatever scene I'm writing that day, and my characters do whatever they darn well please. Okay. <laughs> so you know that makes it interesting and try to make. It I have a together. question for Diana. Um, you have a co-author, yes, and you are a pantser, yes, which I respect entirely. Um, <laughs> that's my life. Okay. And uh, what I want to know is if you keep some sort of world bible or a character yes. bible that helps you. Yes, I have several things that I keep track of every character, and when I go to the next book, I add things. And when someone mm -hmm. dies, I make sure I say how they die. And when um, the world has changed, the blurred location has changed. I live on Google Maps because mm -hmm. this is post-apocalyptic. We're still in America. Yeah. And geolo geographical features don't really change that right. much unless there's a volcano or yeah. something this way. So that I do try to keep track of where I am and all of the people in my story. So I know exactly who they are, what they've done, where they've been, you know. So I don't have to go reread everything and yeah, and that's, that's helpful as a, for a plotter, too, because yeah. especially as, as the series gets longer and longer, right. it's so easy to forget. Yes. Uh, I'm continually picking up two books ago. And going, Wait a minute, <laughs> what was that name again? Right, so if you keep that, that really does help you be organized, even if you just kind of put people in situations. And then in my head, there is like a place I'm going. Yeah. Like, I know I'm going to go here, right. but how we get there is going to be fun. But let's start with, let's do the, the panel. Let's, oh, no. I know, it's fun. <laughs> but I want, I want to help these guys figure out how to turn your book into a series. So how, what do you do with your book that's different than if it's a standalone book that is actually going to turn into a series? What would you do to make, what different things would you do? Go ahead. Um, not resolve every issue. I think I'm very character driven in my writing. Mm -hmm. So I can take this set of characters and even if I resolve whatever problem they were working on, I've got them in a world where there's always gonna be a new problem for right. them to face. Right. But if you want to, I think, establish continuity between your stories and not just have them be a bunch of random tales oh, about the same about people. The same people sorta. You leave issues unresolved. Yeah. They I may mean, be interpersonal issues. They can't be too big. No, but it, so with mine, it's often relationship issues. Right. They, they get the bad guy. Right. But are these two characters going to get together? Right. Are these two characters who are feuding going to fall apart? Right. And that carries then over into the next but, but book. But as long as you don't do something like you leave a cliffhanger that's so obvious, mm. you make the no, reader I, mad. I hate that. Yeah, yeah, I hate that too. So you cannot force me to read your next book. I quit you. Yeah. You know. It, in my case, because this was totally unplanned, you know, I'm, I'm learning. Don't do that. Right. And so, as I was saying earlier, I have to. I'm going to have to figure out a what kind of series it's going to be, and then 
work out all of those kinds of things that, that you're talking about as far as what's going to be the, the story-worthy problem in each book and if it's a continuing character series overall. Or a continuing and if it's a continuing, subject series. Yeah, then that's, that's a different sort of situation. And, and so what are the different situations that are going to happen in each book and how do you connect them and all that? I just recently finished um, a uh, book by a British writer by the name of John Bruner, and this is a book that dates back into the, the mid-80s. It's called The Crucible of Time, and it looked like he didn't really know how to build this world that, that he was describing. He's, basically, he's taking this alien race and taking them from just past the Stone Age to being a, a spacefaring race over the course of one novel. And he, he took a, a, an interesting approach to it in that it's a series of seven novellas or novelettes. Okay. I can see how that was. So, which, which the concept was good, but his process of transitioning from one to the next, there was always this catastrophic thing that happened at the end of the last chapter of each novelette. Did it make you mad? It did. See? It, because it was mainly because some of them felt so forced. Yes, it makes me mad too. I yeah, and I, I really struggled to get through it. You know, it was a good example of, you know, good, bad example. Don't do this. Um, because it was so hard to say, okay, sure, I can buy that. It's just, no, we're going to throw this meter at this thing and boom, we're going to blow up civilization. It's going to take them, who knows how many years, and then they're going to come back and boom, we're in the next uh, next novella. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. So, lesson learned. Don't, don't do, do that. that, you guys. Yeah. Whatever you do in your writing, don't force your reader. Yeah. It's like in D&D, if you're the DM, do not force your players down a certain path. They need to be free to make their own mistakes. Yeah. Okay, well, I have some notes here. Okay. And one of the things that I wrote down was don't, if you're if you're doing something in a common world, not a fantasy, but like in our world, mm -hmm. don't do something, don't put it in your book if it's dated. So, because uh, then when you go mm -hmm. back and you read it seven years from now, you're going, oh, cringe. Oh, that's terrible. So don't put things in your novel that will date your books. That, that can be really, really hard to do. It this can. is this is a, a near world, near future <laughs> series. Right. And so, you know, how do I anticipate you can what the exactly, you know, what you what's what's look gonna look like in But you're not gonna say, Oh, it was the year nineteen twenty, you know, twenty twenty two you're not going to say what year it is, necessarily. I actually did. Okay. <laughs> well, that makes it harder, though. It does. It then, really yeah. does, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I suggest going forward. You know, farther, yes. Farther. Yeah. Right. Farther yeah. enough that you'll be dead before yeah. you're proved wrong, <laughs> yeah. possibly. If that does make it easier, absolutely. I, I do agree avoiding exact... Dates. Right, exact dates, um, exact places. You can, you, if you are working in near future, you can do that without saying, you know, it was 2025 right. or whatever. It's just, you it's clearly it's there's the enough future. recognition that right. this is, yeah. I mean, you talk about J.D. Robb. Right. Her starting year was 1900, 2058. Right. Mm. But again, it's not, it, it's close enough that it's recognizable. Right. And yes. you can see how the world could progress to there. Yes, Even right. if I'm reading Naked and Death right now, the first book, I can still see that this could possibly come to pass. Right. Mm -hmm. I think if you get farther afield, my, my science fiction series is set sometime in the future. Right. If yeah. you're when, a little more vague, it's... When the solar the system is totally stuff. colonized and, right. you know, okay, when would that happen? I don't know. We don't know it could yeah. happen. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. I'm. I am the A plus student. I will ask many questions. I'm good. so sorry. Please do. No, um, Scott has questions. Oh, good. I was just wondering if you made that rule after you wrote this book, which is basically a travel while with Northern Arizona. It's not um, just Northern Arizona. It's also Colorado. Oh, great. 
Yeah. But, but, but you can almost follow that trip on your car. You can. And I that's the Google Maps part. Because <laughs> I wanted to make sure these were real roads that you could. Yeah. Would this possibly have washed out after two years? Probably. So they had, would have to find a walk around or, or mm -hmm. something. And when I first read it and I said no, there were dates. And it's like, no. No, we're not doing that. Yeah. We have to do something different. And you were going to say something. Oh, it makes me think of uh, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, which is like, said now-ish. <laughs> which is, I mean, they're now such brilliant books. And when I read them originally, I thought, oh, man, in 20 years, like, ah, do I feel like that's going to happen? Oh. But now we're living through this time that actually is very close. And right. so it feels almost like maybe you need to have a little prescience if you're going to be too specific in your dates. You can't be. You can't. And so like actual places. Okay, so you wrote about this actual place, and now it's seven years later, and someone goes, where is that actual place? Yeah. Oh, it closed. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't, unless yeah. you later say it closes. It's better to have fictional places yeah. as well, um, just to pre preserve your sense of time, you know. Yeah. Or at least rename the place, because there, there are a lot of right. real places right. in have... this series. But some of them, some of them are. Well, there's there's a church in Carolina, North Carolina. That church really exists, but I have, have completely renamed it. Right. You know, I people can figure out where it is. This, these these books have actual church. these books have yeah. actual places. Yeah. But you know, you still have to say, okay, now it's seven years after. Right. What would it really look yeah. like? What would have happened? Were there wildfires? Were there yeah. you know, what kind of changes have happened? Sure. So it's yes. like you can't really yeah. have all the same eyes, but Yeah. I think I'm just too PC for that. <laughs> 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 Invent my own world and right. I can make it whatever I want it to be. Right. Yeah. Or I go so far in the future that You're if I if yeah. I mention the city of Chicago, it's a different it's place. It's a different place yeah. now. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. I, I I did that with one book and I regretted it. I, I said it in Chicago, a city I know very well, uh -huh. and did a bunch of stuff. Way to go to Chicago and find out that all, those all that places has changed. They move exactly. the streets. What did they do? <laughs> well, but the thing is, a lot of readers are also lazy and won't check. Right. Oh yeah, but I know. then you'll also have readers that go, "Hey, that's not right," oh. and they'll say, "Your firearm stuff here was wrong." Well, I yeah. make sure that it's not wrong because I oh, yeah. a lot of people that use firearms, including myself. There will always be yes. those that's people. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, choose another book. <laughs> yeah. No one is yeah. forcing you yeah. to read this one. Yeah. So, good luck. Choose another author. Have I don't fun. Mind. Yeah. Well, okay. the other thing you run into is you write something, and the 10 year old asks, Well, why didn't you just use a cell phone? Yeah. Yeah. Because, the, you know, there aren't any anymore. Yeah. You know? Uh, the next thing I had was characters' age. Uh, I find that you want to be a little loose and free with the ages. Unless if you're going to, yeah. It, so you have to decide: are you going to follow their exact age? And if you're, you know, ten books in, yeah. now they're fifty. Or are you going to just do a few months apart for each book? Mm. I mean, you have to decide how that's going to work. Are they going to age? Are they going to die? You know, what happens then? Is the series going to continue with right. someone else and their family? Yeah. yeah. So right. you either have to play loose with the age and not really, you know, mention what's what their age is or how much they've aged. And you've got readers going, okay, this is book 17 and they're still 30. Yeah. How is they're that? They're eventful life. Right. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. Again, what what a, it, that kind of depend, can depend on the time frame over which your, that particular story is taking place. So most of my current novels take place over the course of a few days to a week. Okay, right. So then the next book can be the next month. Right. Right. So that's what J.D. Robb does, too. Yeah. So she's got like 45 books, and it, it, it's only been a few years. Uh, and in my case, the, the stories take place over a five-year period, and ages were important to identify for the characters. Right, so that means so, they're going to age realistically. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you have to do that. Yeah. So then that means when you get to your next, if you're going to do more than three, 
no. <laughs> <laughs> it was so painful the first time. Which, which is scary because there is the the door is still open a crack. A chance. But not please not see. Me. <laughs> I still okay. love it. So what why do people read our books? Because it's escapism, really, right? Mm -hmm. Don't we read them for enjoyment? Do we not want to punish our readers? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just feel like, yeah, uh, we need to make them enjoyable enough that you want to reread them. Uh, I was going to put in a rant here about the Foundation series. Uh -huh. Yes. Because when I was like 13 and I first read it, mm -hmm. it was in the 70s, and it was great. Great. I loved it so much. It was so sciencey, and Harry Seldon was so smart, and I just loved it. So I thought, well, they're coming out with a series, so I'm going to reread it. And I found myself cringing so much. And I know it was written in what, 52? It was written in the 50s. Yeah. So. And it was just painful. Oh, the, the problem there, though, so is hard. that you can't predict how people's attitudes and social mores are going to change. We all, it, 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 no, we all write from a point of view yeah. that is essentially frozen in time. That's true. And is probably frozen in time at a much younger age than you are at right now. Right. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah. That is a truism of social okay, media well, theory, I'm, and that's how the brain works. And I know that in the 50s, it was after the war, and they wanted the men to be in charge again. And I know that that is part of it, and I did enjoy it, but I can't anymore, and it's very hard. It's very hard for me to find a series I adored. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah. If I may be the nosy girl that I am. Um, I think when I, as a storyteller, I do improvisational storytelling mostly. Um, but I also interview a lot of authors and host a lot of authors uh, for my live podcast that I do. And one of the things I think is really critical for me as a reader of series is that uh, just because you live in an age and it's sort of like, this is the time perspective I'm writing from, your authors, you can be bigger than the era you're writing in. So what we're writing in the 2020s, like, if you're cutting out half of the population, like, you're doing it wrong, in there my opinion. There was one woman in the first Foundation book. Mm. She was the wife of someone, and she was a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> she was horrible. Yeah. And it's like, that is not representation yeah. of the human race. Yeah, you should be into the Piers Anthony Zant series. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Oh, oh like reading, I started to reread it again. I got a spell for Chameleon. And I was like, yeah. wait a minute. I totally forgot that her whole thing was that when she was beautiful, she was stupid. And when she was ugly, she was smart. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I know. We, you could say the same thing, though, about any of yeah. the classic works. And you I'll go back now Dune. and read Dune. Dune. You Hold read H. Beam Piper, which is even worse uh, if you're yeah. going to take our frame of reference yeah. and hard. impose it on his. It won't break my memories of the enjoyment I had from the books, but it does. it is disheartening. And it makes me really be aware, you know, when you're writing something, you kind of got to be evolved, I guess. I Except do. Except that you don't know what it will be in yeah, another 30 or 40 years. But I, I, and I people may read your stuff and go, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. You but Mr. Sure. Davis, I do disagree with you a little bit because there are many authors from the past who, when they looked forward from where they were at, they extrapolated not just from the technology but also the social mores and the world around them. Oh, I, 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 I'm like, not saying they didn't. I'm just saying if, not to interrupt, and I apologize, mm -hmm. I, if you enjoyed the book at the time, you can look at it for all its flaws and still enjoy the book. I enjoy the memories I had of the book, but now I can't really enjoy the book. I can, I, yeah. I can buy into that. Yeah. My, I guess what I was trying to say is that we are all doing that, whether we wish to or not. Yes, there were authors in the 50s who wrote very, very forward-looking books. 
you don't like Heinlein particularly, but you can't say he didn't write strong female characters. He did. Yeah. Sometimes. Okay. I, I definitely have my critiques of him, but well, I'm not again, the panelist. But okay. again, that, I'm saying, there. I, I agree with you, there were authors who anticipated a lot of the things that we now find just the way the world ought to be. Um, I'm, I guess what I'm arguing for is a contextual understanding right. of the times in which they were written and the audience that they were written for. Even yep. the women writers at that time were constrained by that social right. yep. structure that they were born yep. into. Yep. And it's hard. It was harder for women writers to break out and have more, uh, a more open opinion. But it's happening. Yeah. It's happening. So that was interesting. That was a good conversation. Let me see what else do I have. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. My question to the other panelists, if uh, and this is from my perspective of writing a series of standalones, essentially. How do you keep from tell, telling the same story you over and over and over again? Well, that's true. Uh, not just not just the same story as the story, but you've got to keep the tone fresh even when you're doing the continuous series you've right. got to keep your characters consistent yeah. the world consistent yeah. but time is going by yeah and how do you avoid the trap of essentially telling that same story again okay. in a different form yeah you have um, to have that, new, that's, new challenges yeah. new things that you're facing you don't yeah. have gas anymore it all went bad after two years how, how do we get around that? Yeah. Oh, someone figured out how to recycle plastic and make a really crude diesel. Okay. Or we got horses. Or whatever it is, you just got to make the world change as your character <coughs> and have your character grow. Yeah. That's what I, mean. I guess that's what I was leading up yeah. to. Yeah. Because for me, the way that the type of things I write, they like J.D. Robb, you're going to tend to encounter the same situations over and over again. again. Yeah. Her strength is that her characters, and particularly her secondary characters, mm -hmm. which are the ones I really love, mm -hmm. grow and change, right. and the relationships change. And that, to me, that's really the attraction right. of that series. Character. So yeah. building strong characters that aren't cookie cutters, yeah. that have flaws, that have personalities, that grow, that learn, that age, that change. That ping brings people back. That and brings people and if back the, the, the new situations yes. that they're facing bring out new flaws, right. new things yeah. that they have to deal with within themselves, right. that you know, not only does that um, challenge you as a writer, but it also gives the, the reader that added experience of seeing, oh, this is something about this character that I didn't know before. Right. How are, how are they going to deal with that? Yeah. Right. You you have a you start out with the young character mm -hmm. has all these hopes and dreams. They all get crushed. All of these bad things happen. Are they going to just sink into despair? Are they going to fight their way out? Are they going to just pull along? Yeah. You know how are they going to react? And how does this new situation force them to respond in a way that's different right. from what, what they had to the last time? Scott, you had a question. I just actually wanted to point out to the validity of it with your question. There's actually a fourth type of series where the world or universe is actually the main character, like Terry Patrick oh, or yeah. Jordan Dickinson. That's true. Okay. Like, like, uh, yeah, the Terry, what is that called? Discworld? Discworld. Yeah. yeah. Discworld. Or the, 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 the main character is Discworld. That's really good. I didn't think it could, maybe yeah. it could be a Discworld too. Oh, yeah, it's also Xanth. Xanth yeah. was also the world. And then the right, people, and so. they just have different characters in each book. Yeah. As much as we go, hmm. Thank you, Scott. I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I do think this world is a great example of someone who yeah. wrote something over decades, and you can read those early yeah. books, yeah. and it's not cringy. I, I don't read them in 2021 and go, gosh, Pratchett, whew, you had a very backwards view of the world. Well, I think that once you hit about in the 70s, I think in the 70s, and things, people could start to see things were changing. The world is changing whether you want it or not. You can go in kicking and screaming into the new world, or you can just go with it and sell more books, you know? Because people aren't going to continue to, I mean, I suppose 
as Asimov still sells books, and I still love iRobot, and I still love the robot novels. I just have, I'm just really mad at the Foundation series right now. <laughs> I listened to it on audio, audio during my commute, and I had it turned up to 150%. <laughs> and one other thing I did that, don't be mad, okay? I pretended all the men were gay. <laughs> and that made it better for me because then it was like, okay, it's the gay overlords and they're just in charge. It's okay. All right. I get it now. That made it better for me and I'm sorry. <laughs> Secretly, it was happening on Fire Island all the time. See? <laughs> I, I do have a grudge against it, but it's okay. <laughs> One thing you're talking about, you can predict the future a little more. You try. I've appended or attended enough different panels about uh, science fiction predicting the future. Mm -hmm. And when you look back at the predictions, I know. the details were <laughs> ungodly different. Right. You've got to put it at this really high level to say, okay, oh, but look he at, predicted this. Yeah, but look well, at Star Trek. Look at Star Trek. It invented iPads. Yeah. It invented cell phones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I except mean, that uh, our friend basic. claims that there wasn't an original idea in Star Trek. Well, that he, in effect, he stole well from I a mean, plot he's welcome that's to true. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I know where he's coming from because all of the, I think what Star Trek did was expose a much wider audience mm -hmm. yes. to some of these things that had been science fiction tropes for quite a while. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, you had things like personal communicators and a functional iPad in novels written in the right. 50s and 60s right. long before Star Trek. Right, but people what didn't exactly. always read that. What Star it's like, Trek oh, did cool. was take those things that the readers in this genre mm -hmm. knew about and put them on the screen. And that was my reaction. The first time they pulled out the community, said, I know what that is. Somebody finally made one. And my grandma was such a science fiction fan, she totally got me into it when I was little and young and malleable. <laughs> and she would be tickled to be able to see me reading a book on a, on a tablet, you know, or just pulling any movie I want out of the air and watching it. Yeah. You know, and the way that they thought it would happen is different, but it's still so cool to me that we live in the future yeah. now. Yeah. Yes, but where's my flying car? Exactly. <laughs> I want the hoverboard. Right? <laughs> you know, I watch people drive on streets. I don't want them to have cars. <laughs> As somebody who. I want to be the only one with a flying car. <laughs> right. Yeah. That was it's, like, it's my flying car. Well, they kind of have one now. It's like a, a plane that turns into a car. Sort of. Yeah, those, those things are coming and gone. It's really this, expensive. Yeah. The, the latest yeah. one, I think, is that an iteration out of Honda. That right. is, yeah. Yes, that's the that is Maybe one that might catch on, but at a couple hundred thousand dollars, right. a copy, it's not going to be for everybody. Okay, yeah. well, not yet. Yeah. But, Maybe. You know, we'll see. Yeah. I don't know. But Bruce is pushing so hard right now about the cars. It's 1,500 miles to my relatives in Washington State. Yeah. How yep. many times am I going to have to stop and recharge? How many right. times do you have to stop and fill up your tank? Right. If I, I could recharge with the speed I fill up my tank, it yep. wouldn't be a problem. Right. That's right. And yep. they have real fast rechargers now. That carbon. There's a carbon battery they're coming out with that recharges very quickly. And it doesn't degrade like lithium. And you have a lot more recharges. But that's like in the future. Yeah. See, the technology we could do now for that, just as an aside. Right is just like you go to um, Kmart or whatever and exchange your Blue Rhino gas cylinder mm -hmm. for your grill. Right. You pull in, they drop the battery out of the bottom, slap a new one in. Right. You don't right. own your battery, you're just renting your battery right. just from... Like the, like the propane. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's an idea. Yeah. That's Wait. a possible future world. Yeah. I would say, though, like, if you drive through West Texas, you better plan your gas stations. Yeah. So I have no problem thinking about planning my electric charge side. Right. Yeah. You're a Texan. I mean, we try not to talk about it, but yes. You also have to remember, when the car was first invented, yeah. it couldn't go more than 30 miles an hour. It needed a special person to be able to fix it. 
Right. Uh, didn't we close? And there were gas stations and in the Middle East. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. It, so the infrastructure built out, and the same thing will happen with, with electric cars. You know, it's it's coming already, but it's, yeah. it's just going to take time to do it. It always seems to take longer. But then I, I look at my life and the, the things that my great grandmother would have loved to have, yeah. and think, okay, it's okay, it's all right, <laughs> we're getting there. Yeah. Well, one thing we've got that I am so happy about is better anesthetics for dental work. Oh my God. <laughs> God is better. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much better. I'm not sure what that has to do with series. Well, however. the future. Yeah. Well, yeah. again, if you, I, I think it goes back to the point of if you are going to set something yeah. in a near future recognizable world, right. it is much, much more difficult. It yes. is, and you have to really be careful with with your locations, yeah. your dates. You don't want dates. You don't want oh, Trump is president, and this happens. You know, you yeah. can't really... Those kinds of details. You can't to, put those in there, yeah. or it's going to mess you up later. <clears throat> yeah. And it also depends on how quickly you're able to produce mm-hmm. the books. I have been extremely slow in getting my books out. So the kinds of things that I put in the Eternity play, I thought, ooh, this, this is really futuristic. Some of that stuff is here now. Right. Yeah, and you know, know that's that's, How do you that's, tell? that's one of the risks. It is. On the flip side, in the third book, Wild Spread, mm-hmm. there's an AI in the protagonist's uh, genetics lab. Okay, so things. But I didn't think of that. You know, there was there was talk of um, artificial yeah, intelligences and that kind like, of stuff yeah. back in 2004 when I started right, this but series. It was not. It was not like what it is now. Yeah. And so, you know, you will miss things. It's just guaranteed. And the slower you are in getting books out, the more that you're going to miss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess if you can get them out every six months. One thing on that that I'm not sure about, even when they talked AI in years previous, they didn't talk about Mm self-programming. Oh, I know. That's scary. It's not scary? No, it's scary. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. No. Sam Hagen's Berserkers. <laughs> I always get really interested when people are like, no. And I'm like, why? Because you're going to treat the robots badly and you know they're going to kill you? Because I'm always nice to my Alexa. I don't want to thank that girl for helping me. Thank you. I mean, I don't want the Terminator rule. I don't. Want to know. <laughs> no. I'm going to keep the word for <laughs> <laughs> this was that was kind of the topic of one of the other the other panels was you know why do we have this trope of the AIs take over and they immediately do something like wipe terrifying. humanity out yeah exactly that's you know, why science fiction in particular and horror and and well, to some degree fantasy I have have always played on our fears right yeah. that's the next I, panel I, I are find... you in the next panel no oh it's a horror what the social commentary is in right. life. And it's like, there yeah. is. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the thing I've always found, I always found the robot series by Asimov frightening. It is. The last thing I want I like is scary. a robot who's going to make me perfectly safe. Right. <laughs> you're dead, and now you're really safe. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't lock you up, I mean, uh, and you'll never I think it was get Stanley out. Schmitz wrote a, a short story, one on Hugo or a Nebula, Nebula back in the 60s called With Folded Hands. Uh-huh. And he took the three laws of robotics to its extreme. Right. Oh. And, it's and we terrifying. all had our personal robot that did everything for us and all we were expected to do was sit in the corner with our hands folded. Because even saying. walking was dangerous. You might fall down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course, I have another question because I'm I'm incorrigible. So uh, what is a series that is a more modern series that's come out now that you think is really an excellent exemplar of how to handle series writing? Because we've talked a lot about old books that were written before some of us were born. So like the last five, the ten Nettie years. The Nettie Acorafor series, Binti. Yes. I love that so much. Yeah. yeah. And um, N.K. Jemisin is oh. way future world. Oh my gosh, that was really good too. The fifth book was for sure. The Broken Earth, I think it's called. Yeah, she, yeah, she wasn't my series. cup of tea, but I, I, I can... I really I, got... I, it took right. a while for me to get into it, it and understand the world. Yeah. But once I did, it was like, oh, I get it now. Mm-hmm. Binti, Binti would be my oh choice my for me. That was great. Yeah. 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 Y
that's so really good. contemporary and very good. Yeah, can, you, can you repeat that name? Binti. It's at uh, Neti Okorafor is the author. But the first book is called Binti. The author of the future is amazing. Yes, no. it was so good though. Um, besides uh, yours. Outside. Besides yours. Which <laughs> ones do you say? Well, <laughs> outside, outside the genre remember. of science fiction and fantasy, uh, we might have mentioned J.D. Robb. Yeah, yeah, she lasts um, forever. I, I read a lot of detective fiction, and I think there's some very good series there. The Trey series? Is that good? It is, yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm a fan of my Conley and Bosch series, not yeah. just because of the TV show. I know show. Bosch is a little yeah. bit misogynistic. But I oh, still he's very misogynistic. Well, still, not a little bit. Okay, good. That's, because but I that's still, Bosch. There, I still enjoy it because he does get his sometimes. But, you know? but again, Again, looking at things in context, that is the character. Yeah. The the other series that I love is um, Elmore Leonard's um, oh, yeah. series about Raylan, and and that was made into the show Justified. Right, right. Now you talk great. about a really misogynistic, out there character. Yeah. You know, he doesn't fit in the world anymore. No, but it's interesting to watch him try. Yeah, <laughs> that was what was good about that. What about you? I don't have a good choice. I. Unfortunately, so much of my reading is off on in other science stuff. Not not necessarily. I you know it's just kind of all over the place okay. right now. So I don't have a good current series that I can point to. Okay, that's okay. We still like you. Okay. <laughs> I was worried. <laughs> oh, no, you were. Yes. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but Jonathan Jonathan Moeller, he does a lot. Um, Child of Ghosts is uh, basically like fantasy. D and D esque, um, but it follows the same character, and she is one of the Ember spies and like hunts down rogue magicians. Or it, it's a really interesting world. Like if you practice pyromancy, you will go insane because working with fire makes you crazy. Apparently, okay, that's mm. cool. But yeah, it's a really I mean, you have the benefit, and then you have the problem. That right, comes with it. I think it's a lot like your type of series. In that you know you follow the same character, but her like the stories are standalone. She solves, she has a new problem, she solves it, and then it goes on. And they do kind of build on each other. But yeah, so let's hope it goes forever. That sounds good. For a while. Anybody else have any good series we should read? If you like the detective fiction, um, Tana French, the um, Double Murder Squad. Yeah, yeah. And I it's agree. an interesting world because it's like a minor character in one book will become. The major character. The major and yeah. and I, I haven't read really them. I'm aware of them. That's excellent. kind of on the list yeah, after we really get through. Good. I'm, I'm down a research rabbit hole now from after. Yeah. <laughs> <all. laughs> it's, it's really hard to read things. Sure. Uh, For pleasure. Yeah. I read so many books. <laughs> but the pandemic really kind of knocked me down. Not because I got sick. I just got so much executive dysfunction. Mm. It was very hard to be creative. Mm-hmm. But it's helped when I got my vax, and I uh, felt like I could be myself again. Does anybody else feel like that? I yeah. Don't know. I Absolutely. my experience would have been totally different because my entire job. Yeah. I'm I'm a trauma and critical care surgeon. That's okay. So, so I that's was hard. I was totally were, on front line. Right, but you're used to being again. That's that's my right. point. Yeah. My life is stress. Going to my doctor was really good because he's like, we're not afraid of you. If you have COVID, it's okay. We won't get sick. And it was like, it just made everything better, just yeah. going to my yeah. regular yeah. appointments. But it was really hard uh, because I still had to go to work. My boss insisted nobody wear a mask. Mm-hmm. So it was just a very stressful time. Yeah, and, and my situation was different again mm-hmm. because things really didn't change for me. I, I am a writer now, and so I was... Staying at home doing my writing. Just like you normally would. When the, the pandemic hit, the things that changed were the, the in person meetings that I had been going to all moved online. But other than that, I was staying at home writing just oh. as I had been staying at home writing. The That's sad really commentary good. on my life is my social ch- life changed not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt I felt totally enclosed. And I'm yeah. a social person. Yeah. I love people and I love coming to conventions and doing things. Mm-hmm. It just made me yes. feel like not myself anymore. That was the one thing I did miss, yeah. Yeah. being in places in like person. this. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. This yeah. kind of spontaneous give and take just yes. doesn't exist in yeah. online meeting. Yeah. And, yeah. It can't. Yeah. yeah. One of the women in, in my critique group is that way, where she, it, it really hurt her. I mean, I never not thought. Not be able to interact with people face to face like we're yeah. doing now. Well, so at least I had work, yeah. but it was scary. <laughs> and yeah. my boss did get COVID, yeah. but I did not. So, I mean, yeah, there's everybody goes who's stuck. Yeah. I don't know. I've never had writer's block before in my life. It mm -hmm. was the weirdest. Wow. Feeling. Well, one of the things that was weird to me is there's two or three groups that uh, some we meet in person and then some we wouldn't. But <laughs> you suddenly find out that one, two, three people in the group are either really bothered by the risk catching COVID or had immune problems or decided they could that. not be fit to, to come to the meetings in right. person right. anymore. And then you're afraid for your friends. I know, I'm sorry, this is now a COVID support group <laughs> for the rest of the evening. I mean, every convention is like this. It's all support, COVID support. Yeah, group. right yeah. now? Yeah. yeah. It'll get better, I hope. We collectively went through a trauma. Yeah. Yeah, we did. So still going through a trauma. Yeah, I'm not going to do that again. We had trauma bonded for life, though. Every week, until 2020 or 2021, we probably years did not. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I guess it went through like a whole series. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, that was like yesterday's big bombshell. What? Dear, our COVID reservoir oh, COVID will never go away. Never well, it's going like away. the flu. Yeah, it yeah. will never ever yeah. go away because yeah. it jumped yeah. from yeah. animal yeah. to person. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The only viruses or diseases that we even could dream of eliminating are diseases where humans are the only vector. Right. And the only one we've really been successful with is smallpox. Although, and that's because there is no animal vector for smallpox. Um, there are others that we're getting close. But now there's so many anti-vaxxers, it's really weird. Well, those people... That can be kind of self-correcting problems. I know. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. But it's again, hard, hard it's, to it's say. hard to say that, but it's so true. And it's like, you guys... It's easier. But, but, but those, peop no, those people <laughs> are... To, to yeah. take a slightly different take on that, those people are focusing on a very tiny risk of a bad thing right. happening. Yeah. Right. So how many people in here would not get diagnostic x-rays done because of the radiation? Yeah. So. I mean, we're all vaccinated. Let's put it this way. If you have children, <laughs> if you have children, would you allow your child to have a CAT scan? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm talking to the choir. Yeah. Right. <laughs> For a kid to get an excess cancer from a CAT scan would require something like 8,000 CAT scans. <laughs> Yeah. To get enough millisievert exposure to cause a cancer. At my age, 20,000 CAT scans. Who's going to get 20,000 CAT scans? Yeah. But these people have focused on this one small one risk problem. total aggregate risk of a bad event from the COVID 19 vaccine is about 0.3%. Okay? Your risk of dying in your car whenever you drive to work is 0.1%. Yeah. Okay. We don't worry about driving. Why would we worry about COVID? Well, these people have That's decided scary. that this is scary. This is something they don't understand. And it's a cognitive dissonance. It's taken over their brain. And no amount of persuasion is yeah. going to convince yeah. them. Either that or it's the political well, some decision. of it's political, and, yeah. and that feeds into it, yes. and that's the worst part of it, yeah. because you've allowed that then to become an acceptable thing within a certain group, yeah. and that's the travesty of it all. Yeah. Oh, wow. but, I feel but like you you've can't had say... this conversation before as yeah. a doctor. Yeah. You seem very well informed. <laughs> we have I two have, minutes. Yes. We have two minutes, so... Any questions, COVID or non-COVID or series related? Series related. Let's get back to the topic. <laughs> I'd like to make a recommendation for reading, okay. uh, especially for you, uh, since you do post-apocalyptic writing. Kit Roca's Mercenary Librarians is delightful. Okay, I've got to send you that one. I will. Okay. Post-apocalyptic. Two people writing I it. love post-apocalyptic. And it's librarians taking on the back end. I, like <laughs> I will read that. 
It's so very good. Percent. Did you have? Yeah. yeah, more of just a comment. I, how would you feel about a series that was like an A to Z thing? And it, like the A is for alibi. Yeah, A like, is for burglar because that was a Sue Grafton. Attacking um, Annie, beating. Sure, do like, it. Yeah, I yeah. Know. Take your thing and do it, baby. Yeah. Whatever spurs you and inspires you to keep that thing going. Right. And yeah, you know what? Not? What I, my motto is: read, write something you want to read. Yes, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I read a lot. I read a lot. I read a lot of different things, and I wrote books that I like to read. Virtually every book I've ever written has been. Why hasn't somebody written this book? Yet? Right. Yeah. I'll do it myself. Right. <laughs> so be the book areas. you want to see in the world. Write that book. I mean, it's right now, right? I just wanted to make sure I was You're doing it, really. You're doing good. <laughs> Thanks. I think that sounds fun. I don't, like, I thought about that in later books, but I just wanted to, like, when you have it on the spine, it just be like A, B, C, D. Yeah. Sure. Are you a plotter? I, for this, I'm she I mean, like, I tried dancing it, and then I'm a very so. wonderful manager. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's it. So if you want, you can stay here and see and do the horror movie one, which is really, really good. It's horror as social commentary. I know James is on this, right? Are you on this panel? What's horror as social commentary? Oh, wait, no. um, You're doing this one, movie. right? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good, good. And some of us will be doing panels and such. Oh, oh too. Oh, too. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening.